Okay, well, it looks like it's time to, uh, to get started. So uh, let me ask you first, uh, folks, uh, when did you become first involved with open source software? Anybody did that in 90s? Anyone? 90s? Okay, couple of hands. What about 2000s? Okay, more. 2010 plus? Okay, cool, cool. Well, uh, I myself uh, belong to that uh, first group, and uh, uh, I was uh, involved in open source software in, uh, uh, in 90s, and uh, uh, at that time, a lot of stuff we do with open source software was uh, a lot more complicated than right now, right? I remember you would have to often download the sources and maybe have some extra patches to apply to make him run on your operating system, figure out dependencies, compiler, and all this kind of uh, good stuff. And then you finally get that uh, open source software running and you feel like uh, a hero, right? Anybody remember that? Well, uh, since that, uh, we had this never-ending move to simplicity with their uh, open source software making that much more uh, accessible. Right from that, download, sources, patch, compile, we got wonderful innovation of targz binaries first, and then install script, then uh, we got uh, packages with dependencies put in repositories, and, uh, and so on and so forth, right? And now we also see a lot of move to this, you know, self-contained, where uh, we have deployments with no dependencies at all, such as, uh, you know, Docker, Snap, and, uh, Mm, uh, some others, right, which makes it uh, easier and easier, right? And uh, as a topic of this presentation is we are going to talk uh, about uh, uh, database in uh, Docker. Uh, or I would even uh, more broadly talk about that as running database in, in container because we have now more uh, uh, container runtimes uh, becoming available, right? And if you think about that, Docker itself, as a Docker proper, actually is uh, losing some of the uh, market share mm, in uh, this regard. So, where do we see databases run uh, as a uh, as a Docker? Uh, why, and what are the benefits of that solution? Now, what is wonderful running database in Docker is what you can get this very clean, isolated from other components environment. Right, hey, you know, you want to run different versions uh, of uh, a database on the same host, you can just, you know, spin it up in different containers, shut it down, right? I don't, don't have to figure out, well, if I want to install, let's say, MySQL 5.7 and MySQL 8 at the same host, and maybe also, you know, try, uh, does my application work with Percona server or MariaDB, that is a lot of hassle. It is much easier with Docker. And then I also can uh, uh, use something like Docker Compose to, uh, to, to build out like a whole uh, environment where basically, you know, just uh, uh, changing that single uh, source can, uh, can help me to test my application with different, uh, different uh, uh, database versions, right, or database variants on my, uh, on my system, uh, which is uh, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely wonderful, and we see fair amount of uh, of embracement of running databases in uh, in Docker when it comes to test and dev. Now, what is uh, about prod? Here are things uh, I would say slightly uh, more complicated. First, uh, if you look in production, we have additional goals be beyond this kind of simplicity and convenience. We need performance, we need security, we need high ability, and so on uh, and so forth, right? And that is where we may get some uh, questions. One is fear of overhead. If you Google, you'll find, especially in the early days of uh, Docker, uh, there would be uh, relatively significant overhead of running uh, databases, right? Like uh, under significant load with uh, Docker. A lot of those have been resolved in, uh, uh, since that, right? At least this kind of a recipe is how to configure that. Uh, so that is not the case, but that was uh, uh, the problem. 
Uh, another, I would say, is extra complexity for production deployment, right? For example, you need to use things as you know, data volumes, and if you forget about that, then destroying container, while well, you may lose uh, all your data, not just uh, 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 their, uh, their application, right? And I think some people got some of the, uh, uh, you know, unfortunate experience uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. Uh, and finally, I would mention their uh, virus monitoring and observability tools especially initially not everything supported docker pretty well and again if you're running database in uh, uh, production really understanding in depth how well or not well it performs how to fix the problems arise it becomes very mm, uh, very important so if you look at the uh, uh, open source databases uh, in docker we can see what most uh, open source databases have official docker images and there are often some uh, uh, third-party ones uh, you can find. They are very commonly used for test and dev, uh, but uh, directly as Docker, uh, use in uh, uh, production is relatively limited. We have seen also some people build, let's say, some their own uh, homebred uh, orchestration, which would use Docker as a component, especially in the times uh, before Kubernetes, but that is not really uh, use very uh, commonly. If you uh, ask where Percona stands, well, we do also provide our Docker images for our distributions for uh, MySQL, uh, uh, MongoDB, uh, and Postgres, right? And we provide uh, what you can uh, call enhanced enterprise grade distribution, right? Where we have a lot of features which are only available in uh, MongoDB and MySQL enterprise, right? They are are available uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Perpona. Uh, I have this uh, in, uh, free and open source here, which is actually not completely correct, right? Because I think since I first uh, wrote it, uh, uh, MongoDB changed the, the license to SSPL, which is obviously non-open source, uh, non-compete license. But well, that is something what we have to uh, also follow uh, at Perpona. Now let's look about uh, at the unsolved problems, which specifically uh, correspond to this kind of Docker, and even if you attempt to orchestrate the Docker. First and foremost, this is a day two operations. If you think about developers, in, uh, as developer, you may treat a database as kind of similar to your application. Saying, hey, you know, I spin up a test database, I run my buggy application on it, I mess it up, and then I, you know, restart it from uh, reprovision is from scratch, right? And and wherever I mess up, I can just throw a database away uh, and and rebuild it. But this is not really how uh, production databases works, right? The, many of them are expected to stay up, keep their data, not losing their data for years or even more more probably decades, right? And that means what provisioning that database, right, is a just a tip of the iceberg compared to keeping that uh, database uh, functional and operating, right? Most important stuff is what we call day two operation. How can we maintain that database, upgrade when it's needed, maybe to scale it and so on and so forth, right? And that is uh, their uh, Docker, right? And uh, uh, Docker Swarm is not really providing very good uh, uh, solutions. That is where, if we really want to have a kind of high level of uh, automations, we really need the concepts which are not limited as to what we do in a concept of a single node, but really be able to work with, a, uh, with a, you know, like a cl cluster environment, if you will. And that is where Kubernetes comes in place. How many of you are familiar with Kubernetes here? Okay, good number of hands. Anybody running database on Kubernetes? Okay, uh, a smaller hands. Okay, well, I asked familiar Kubernetes. Anybody runs Kubernetes in production in their environment? Okay, not uh, as many hands. Well, anyway, so uh, for those who don't know, Kubernetes, uh, you can think about uh, that as Linux, but not for the single node, right, where you typically remain running Linux, right, but 
for the, the data center, right, for like actually whole your, uh, uh, whole your e infrastructure, right? And Linux comparison, of course, is loose, right? Because uh, with decades between those technologies, Kubernetes uses uh, many different concepts. Like it uses declarative API rather than, uh, I would say, like an action-driven uh, 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 interface, right, we have for, uh, uh, for Linux. If you think about Kubernetes and databases, it has kind of a uh, complicated relationships from early on, right? Because I think Kubernetes was initially uh, created, right, envisioned by people who didn't quite like databases that much, right? They focused, well, application, right? We should have applications and applications has to be stateless. And Kubernetes is going to be awesome solution to run those stateless application, kind of like a scale them, you know, uh, do upgrades, like whatever, mm, you know. And then uh, what about state? Well, that is somebody else's problem, right? We are not messing with that, you keep state somewhere outside of Kubernetes. But obviously as Kubernetes uh, has became so dominating in many modern data centers, right, that uh, uh, could not be positioned anymore, right? And uh, 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 we got a lot of uh, improvements in, uh, uh, in Kubernetes for uh, focus on specifically data intensive applications. Right, just what was it? Uh, uh, last week I attended DockerCon uh, in, uh, uh, in Detroit and actually we had uh, their, uh, kind of one of those uh, pre-conference day which is focused about data on Kubernetes. Right, and you can see a lot of companies from uh, big enterprises attending that event because they're either running a lot of data intensive applications on Kubernetes or mm, considering to do that. So here is uh, that tweet from uh, Kesley Hightower, right, which as you can see about three years old uh, by now, right? That would be uh, you know, pretty interesting where he stands right now, right, because a lot of has changed in those uh, three uh, plus years. What exactly we can see has changed in, a, in practice, right? And what I like to point out here is what the proof is actually in the pudding. If you look at a lot of uh, uh, new generation public database as a service, right, which are built within, I think, like launch within, next uh, last three years, right, and probably build it in like last five years, uh, all of them tend to be built by, uh, on the Kubernetes. It's Kubernetes in the back end, right? So what that tells us is what a property engineered, you can run databases uh, on Kubernetes, right, and you can do that uh, efficiently enough and providing good availability and security, well, because otherwise those folks would, you know, probably uh, run out of business. I mentioned data on Kubernetes community, right, in the day uh, I, uh, the talk day I attended. They also have like an interesting presentation uh, about uh, from their members, which is kind of, of course, slightly biased sample, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, this is for people who already uh, get that uh, idea of running data intensive application on Kubernetes. But uh, uh, you can see what for them there is a sp uh, significant amount of people mm, uh, running workloads on Kubernetes, and I would encourage you also, if you're interested in that topic, to check out that report. It has some other uh, interesting insights, in my mm, opinion. So, okay, let's go back and talk a little bit more about uh, Kubernetes, what it is, and what's really the promise as it's relevant for the databases, right? As I mentioned already, you can think about that as an operating system for uh, your whole data center. And that is uh, really wonderful because one of the challenges, if you will, of uh, uh, managing mm, of uh, database automation is uh, that kind of uh, node level failures. You can say, well, let's say have a three node clusters, one of those nodes die. How do I heal it? Well, you cannot actually do that without getting some other node to come by, right? So you can, you know, provision a database on it and, uh, and get a cluster, right? If that 
Phil Snow died, uh, died for good, right? And in this case, that means we have to have an API which not only works inside the node, right, but which works outside uh, the node, right, allowing them to control uh, those kind of uh, uh, other primitives, right? Well, to have a more nodes provision join the cluster or have like scale those nodes higher if a database needs uh, more resources and, and so on and so forth. So uh, robust mechanics to, to deal with node failure, I think that is an, uh, an important. And one of the additions which was uh, added to, uh, to Kubernetes specifically focused on database and other complicated interfaces is, is the uh, uh, operator framework, right? Because what operator framework does, instead of just saying, hey, you know what, uh, I need five copies of X running, right? And you know what, they're all kind of the same. If you know you, you know, kill one of them, not a big deal. Well, database is like a little bit more gentle approach, right? If you want to make sure you, for example, do rolling upgrade of your cluster, you need to do that in a particular order. You also need to understand that things may go wrong, right? And you may need to uh, have to kind of go back uh, to, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that process, right? Not to uh, leave your database in kind of like a half upgraded state, right? Or some, uh, something like that, which just does not happen if you just have your, well, stateless application, right? Hey, I have the old version. I always can replace that with a new version, right? Well, uh, th that is not the case of database, at least if you care uh, about your, mm, your data. Now, with databases on Kubernetes, situation is, uh, is a little bit uh, different. We can see that slower pickup uh, by uh, many of the vendors. And I think that is uh, because in uh, uh, many cases, vendors actually pushing uh, the competitive solution. So if you think about uh, MongoDB, for example, how does uh, MongoDB want you to run databases in the cloud? Well, they wanted to use MongoDB Atlas, right? That is uh, uh, their focus, right? If you think about uh, uh, MySQL owned by Oracle, well, uh, same stuff, right? I mean, they want you to run MySQL on uh, OSI uh, first and foremost, right? And the kind of uh, having awesome Kubernetes would be, you know, sending a com, uh, com operator would be sending com, uh, conflicting message, right? Or if you look at uh, MariaDB, well, they also also wanted to run Sky as well, right? Situation with MariaDB Corporation, I find this kind of a most funny because they even kind of had the open source operator, but then they say, no, 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 we don't want anything competing with Sky as well. It's kind of magically disappeared. Right to a point what it's you would be hard pressed to find any mention <laughs> of that uh, operator anywhere on the a website. Right, it's kind of like it's never existed. Well, it's now that is what uh, underpowers uh, uh, Sky SQL. Right, and in fact, there are actually have been many third-party solutions uh, created because well, whatever you may want uh, to do as a uh, as a vendor, well, people in your community may have some other ideas. Right. And I think that is a very wonderful thing, right? What happens in the open source community at large, right? What you may have your commercial goals of the vendors, right? And then you have a community which may have a different uh, goals and it may innovate independently to the point of exercising their right to fork if they don't like where that vendor uh, goes, right? Well, that happens with MySQL and MariaDB more recently uh, uh, then Elasticsearch, you know, doubled down on open, you know, the, the open search happened, right? So uh, I think that's, uh, you know, fantastic thing what, that, uh, what it's possible in uh, an open source. Well, anyway, so if you think about how open source databases uh, exist on uh, this, um, uh, in a Kubernetes, it's kind of be a little bit complicated, right? You may hear about the Helm charts and operators and also Helm charts which deploy the operators, <laughs> right? So in your case, uh, what uh, I would encourage you is to look solutions which are uh, include the operator component in this case because there is an operator which exactly does that smart day two 
uh, data activities, right? What Helm chart uh, does, if it's, you know, simply uh, takes and kind of deploys basically with Docker images, right? Well, that's only focused on deployment day one operation. It's maybe good enough for test and dev, but if you are really looking to run it in production for a prolonged period of time, that is not, uh, uh, not good enough. So what we've been doing uh, in uh, uh, Percona, we have uh, operators for all, all the database we support, MySQL, uh, uh, MongoDB, and uh, Postgres, right, which you can install either directly as an operator or also we provide a Helm chart if, if you're using Helm chart to uh, deploy uh, uh, solutions in your uh, data center. Now, things that I would say which are not completely solved with the operator itself is this, right? If you drink Kubernetes Kool-Aid, you will be very happy with uh, operators. It's like, hey, you know what? I have uh, infrastructure as a code. I have this, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, YAML file. If I need to configure something, you know, change, commit, deploy, all kind of wonderful, right? Now, if you have been spoiled or wrongly educated by folks like uh, AWS, right? Say, well, you know what? You need to use RGS with that kind of API and, and look at for that kind of point and click experience. Well, that is not something what the Kubernetes provides for databases out of the box. And also, or, uh, as I said, you can engineer solutions which run very well in Kubernetes you can also uh, uh, screw things out if you do not configure things cor correctly, right? For example, you have to understand such as like an anti-affinity rules, right? Because if you accidentally deploy all your database pods on a single, you know, physical server in your private environment and that server goes down, guess what? You lost all your database nodes, right? So you have to uh, really kind of think uh, about those things. and. Uh, to be granted, right, some of them we are trying to uh, set the same defaults in operators, right, so you, it's not easy to shoot yourself in the foot, but uh, it still may require a certain amount of engineering to configure, right, you know, instance sizes, storage, and whatever, so your database is the most robust. So if you look at uh, uh, really the state in the cloud, the state of our simplicity is that database as a service, right? That is something which uh, I mentioned, Amazon RDS, uh, uh, MongoDB Atlas, right? It's becoming pretty ubiquitous, but even like a smaller second tier clouds, like, you know, Lino, DigitalOcean, uh, Vulture, right? They all uh, offer some kind of uh, database as a service uh, uh, right now. Right. Now, mm, that is uh, fantastic, and we have a lot of uh, uh, usability out there, uh, but I think, especially if you uh, subscribe to open source principles is what those proprietary clouds, they do bring us some great usability and simplicity, but at a great cost. And cost, I mean both as a uh, ideological cost, if you will, because you have to really lock in and uh, run proprietary uh, solutions and have them kind of decide what technology will be accessible uh, to you, right, and how it's going to be uh, uh, to be priced, uh, uh, right, and kind of what extensions they will be allowed to run and on, right? A lot of technological conditions, as well as literal cost, right? Because if you think about mm, running RDS right now, in many cases, would be close to two times as expensive as if you, you know, roll it out uh, uh, yourself, right? Of course, if you just you know one single node, that, that's not significant, but if you're application becomes huge when doubling your bill is kind of uh, important. So what do we really have right now in database as a service, right? And unfortunately, you can see the property reward is, uh, is highlighted in too many places here. We have major clouds which are offering their proprietary solutions, right? We have also database vendors have their own proprietary solutions uh, in the cloud, right? MongoDB Atlas, SkySQL, uh, like uh, whatever. And those often span uh, many uh, different clouds, but they're still, uh, the, well, uh, at the mercy of that uh, uh, vendor. And then they also have like a multi-database, multi-cloud proprietary solution like Avian, Instacluster, 
uh, and so on and so forth, right? And some of those may tell, oh, we are actually open source, right? And what they mean is, well, we take a stock open source database, but our management kind of API, right, and this kind of stuff is actually, uh, is actually um, uh, proprietary. Now, why database as a service is, uh, is important? Well, because it really removes a lot of toil. Right, if you think about uh, developers in particular, right, they may not be as excited as some of their database engineers to you know, deal with all of that kind of nitty gritty database operation stuff. Right? If a database as a service, that means you don't need to deal with high ability, with tab patching, backups, right? it's uh, relatively easy to scale by the credit card, right? which is, well, good and bad, <laughs> right? It's maybe easier for you to do your job, right? Because you don't have to actually figure out how to optimize your database, right? Then, you know, you can just go to their, uh, to the larger instance, right? And in this case, I think it's kind of uh, very interesting. From our observation, when we speak about those databases which are very easy to scale by the credit card, they typically come with a very poorly optimized applications. Right, because in good old times, then if you order big server, you still have to wait for three months for that to be arrived, right? You still have to figure out how to live in the meanwhile. So people would often just have to, have no choice but develop the skills how to uh, optimize their uh, databases, right? Now often, you know what, I can just get a bigger box in five minutes, why bother? Well, and somebody else is picking up a bill until they don't. So another uh, thing, of course, what is uh, uh, interesting in database as a service is what it is often marketed as open source compatible, right? And what that means uh, is uh, typically what I like to call as a Hotel California compatibility, right? And we're making, hey, it's very easy to check in those databases as a service, right? Hey, you know what? It's easy to move your applications to that, but you know what? Then the idea is to uh, get you addicted to some additional features like Amazon Aurora, right, where it provides. So it will become very hard or impossible to move those uh, applications back. Also, you will find the database as a service often uh, marketed as a fully managed, right? And it's kind of very interesting, right, how marketing works, right? Because you can see cloud vendors on one extent like to, uh, like to market uh, their solutions as a fully managed, but then if you ask, oh, who's responsible for security? It's fully managed, are you? No, it's shared responsibility. What about performance? Shared responsibility. Well, guys, can you pick? Is it shared responsibility or is it fully managed? Well, the definition, of course, of fully managed, right, in many cases, hey, hey you know, we are uh, doing our part, but what uh, we see many organizations feel, well, that means you don't have to do anybody, have to have anybody who understands anything with databases, which is a problem on organizational scale because that can come, you know, security mistakes, high ability problems, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, inability to really, you know, scale beyond, uh, beyond the credit card and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the next thing, uh, of course, what I uh, believe of database as a service is uh, this uh, uh, issue of their uh, vendor lock-in because, uh, you know, obviously if uh, 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 it uh, is likely to get uh, even more painful in the future. Why I'm being such a Cassandra here? And I don't mean Cassandra as a database technology. That one is wonderful. Well, because we have been uh, uh, here before. Do you know, guys, who is that young, good-looking guy? Anyone? Well, that is Larry Ellison himself. And what is Larry doing in his career? Well, he is actually saving people from their lock-in, which we, hardware lock-in, which we experience with that nasty big blue, right? But when 
Uh, and that is a kind of a very similar story, right? Like Amazon says, hey, escape Oracle. Amazon Aurora is wonderful. But then as uh, people have been substantially saved, then what Oracle did, well, uh, move to the next time of a business strategy, right? Where we often come to, uh, well, to a point where even a uh, saying exists, what Oracle doesn't have customer, Oracle has hostages. Anybody heard that? Oh, yes, yes, uh, you heard. So what about cloud computing in general? Well, and why I think it's kind of a sum of a history repeats itself here, which is very interesting, right? Well, this is an image I didn't draw, right? I took it from Amazon Web Services, one of our early presentations of a cloud. You can see there's even old logo here. And they have been comparing the cloud to electricity. Saying, hey, cloud is wonderful. That makes sense for you to create your own electricity, right? At scale, we can do that cheaper, easier, scalable, just consume, right? Well, and at that time, when we have been getting that, let's say, commodity blocks, right, storage, compute, which have been, have been a relatively similar, simple building blocks for all of the cloud, it makes sense. But then we went ahead to have this highly proprietary solution, uh, right, which only runs on that cloud. When you think about, you know, Amazon Aurora, uh, Google Spanner, uh, and so on and so forth, right? We just kind of thinking, well, you know what? Uh, uh, if you buy your TV, it only works if you buy electricity from us, right? That is not really their commodity analogy anymore. But that is, at large extent, happily is our choice to make because a lot of clouds, they do provide a lot of those commodity interfaces. And that is where the situation actually even became better over the last few years with the Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes is that uh, universal API which is available on both public and private cloud. Even Amazon had to adopt that, right? They had initially their own container management or whatever, right? But you know, when everybody wanted Kubernetes, well, that kind of you know, had been overlay, uh, overtaken by Amazon managed uh, uh, Kubernetes service. So what I believe uh, with uh, our choice in the Kubernetes, right, that is our choice how we are looking to mm, adopt the cloud, right? And we can go even that's like AWS, Google, Azure, doesn't matter, right? I mean, I'm just using uh, them as their biggest and most successful proprietary cloud in US. Or you can uh, uh, go uh, uh, cloud native, right, which is their name uh, what I would say like a Kubernetes based uh, ecosystem has, right? We, there is a lot of uh, uh, very cool uh, uh, de uh, development happening, right? Uh, I have this kind of uh, uh, zoom in of a state of that cloud uh, uh, computing universe, right? And uh, you probably can't read those all the logos, but that doesn't matter. I think what's important is it is large and there is a lot of projects being devo developed, right, to solve uh, a lot of similar problems to what Amazon or Google, right, services are clo closing, which uh, are focused on. And similar, similar to what often happens if open source, right, it takes a longer time to catch up, but it is inevitable. Now, I remember in late, uh, in the late uh, 90s, I had a lot of friends who were running proprietary Unixes, Solaris, HP UX, AX, and so on and so forth, right? And I was running Linux. And everybody's idea was Linux was a joke, right? Some of you may not remember that, but at that point it was like 32 bits. It uh, didn't do multiple CPUs particularly well. We even couldn't have files more than two gigabytes in size on, on those like an early versions of Linux. Right? Just a toy uh, database, but well, guess what? With uh, all our work as open source community, it caught up and overtook you know, all the Linuxes. Like, well, how many of you are running Solaris now? Well, not many. Well, anyway, so in uh, uh, our uh, thoughts uh, at Percona, if you will, 
is what the Kubernetes is that, uh, that wonderful API which exists on uh, a lot of the platforms and that is actually pretty uh, robust and powerful. Uh, I wrote a blog post recently about how to, uh, you know, you can go through like tutorial how to run operators of Minikube, you know, deploy, scale, whatever. You'll be just like, wow, right? It is so much easier, right, to get a cluster going on Kubernetes compared to if I'm doing that kind of conventional download, you know, RPM packages, configure that and all the kind of stuff, right? You know, much, much uh, more robust. And we are also working as a part of our uh, Percona monitoring management uh, product on uh, uh, the GUI, so you can provision uh, databases in RDS-like uh, experience. Right? And by the way, PMM is a 100% open source uh, uh, product, right? So I'm not telling you here, buy from Peter instead of buying from Amazon, right? That's not the point. So if you look at the open source database uh, uh, experience, uh, we see that the important things is as an interface, what we are going to provide you deploy a full database cluster, a single API call, or you know, a couple of GUI clicks, right? And that uh, really does the same things automatically what you would expect from, from uh, RDS, right? Of course, there is also like a management part, right? Because if you're running RDS, if things kind of uh, besides all that kind of automation things break, well, then there are some, you know, Amazon people which are going to fi uh, fix it in the back. And that is something what, uh, well, is not really solvable in software and you can uh, either uh, do it yourself, right, or work with uh, uh, the partner. You know, that partner may be your corner or that may be somebody else running uh, their uh, open source software, right? I think that's kind of, give and take if you are playing right in uh, open source. So, as a summary, I think the dirty ways as a service are going on this uh, path from uh, uh, containers to really having a fully available open source database as a service experience, right? As I said, the Docker support is quite ma mature, so Kubernetes support is kind of getting there, and database as a service experience is still work in progress. Even from uh, uh, per, per corner, that is uh, currently a uh, tech uh, uh, preview feature. And you know what? The good news is in open source, you always can be part of solution, right? If you think something is missing, something doesn't fix your, uh, your needs, you can uh, contribute your ideas, uh, uh, your code, maybe bugs uh, you found, and all of that are uh, appreciated by open source community. So as you mentioned, their database as a service uh, have won. Then their login sucks. And well, open source is uh, uh, coming to the rescue. And one last slide uh, uh, in this case, right? If, uh, if you really want to play with uh, our uh, database as a service on Kubernetes, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, partnered with uh, one of vendors to, uh, to get like a, you know, free test Kubernetes cluster. You know, you can, uh, don't have to install it yourself, right? Or get a managed solution in some of the clouds. You can, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, play with it. See if it uh, works for you to adopt or maybe, you know, report some bugs. With that, uh, it's all I have. And I even have a few minutes for questions.